Well, we're out at La Trobe University to have a discussion on Australian nationalism. And Australians have been discussing nationalism before we were a fully fledged Australia. It comes in great waves in my lifetime. I've seen it peak during turbulent times around, say, One Nation, around the refugee crisis, around the desire to have a republic. But most important of all, at the time when Whitlam had uh, commenced his brief and turbulent government, one of the first things Gough decided to do was to dump the honour system, the imperial honour system, and to have one uh, for Australia, for Antipodean purposes. And I remember writing him an open letter, this is almost 40 years ago, saying this was terrific, but you should go one step further and get rid of the, uh, the use of sir and dame. You won't remember this, most of you, but we did in fact have sirs and dames under the Order of Australia system. And I suggested that we introduce new terms and that they be mate and cobber. It seemed to me that both of them were free of uh, you know, gender, specificity, and they had a certain eucalyptic ring to them. Unfortunately, Goff didn't do that, but I am going to do it today because we've gathered together on the stage some quite extraordinarily gifted mates and cobbers. First of all, mate Marilyn Lake, sitting on my right, awarded a personal chair in history here at La Trobe, in 1994, since then, she's held visiting professorial fellowships at Stockholm, University of WA, the ANU, and the University of Sydney. She's published a dozen books and an infinite number of articles and book chapters in Australian and international anthologies on subjects ranging from labour history to land settlement, sexuality and citizenship, gender and nationalism. And uh, Marilyn, like the rest of my guests today, will shortly mount the lectern and deliver an opening statement. Gasson Hajj, Professor, now Cobber, Cobber, Cobber Hajj, is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities and he's the University of Melbourne's future generation professor of anthropology and social theory. He uh, joined Melbourne after 15 years of teaching and researching at the University of Sydney and he's researched and published widely in the comparative anthropology of nationalism, multiculturalism, racism and migration. Ray Gator, well, Ray, you're here by both a cobber and a mate, uh, currently Foundation Professor of Philosophy at, at uh, the Australian Catholic University and Professor of Moral Philosophy at King's College, London. Each year he's in England uh, from October until the beginning of the academic year at ACU. It's to his great credit that he practiced what he preaches and he preaches the need for philosophers to address an educated and hard thinking lay audience as well as their colleagues. And I'm particularly pleased to have him here because I saw the issue of Australian nationalism through the prism of the film industry we didn't have. And um, most recently, he was responsible for a really remarkable Australian film, Romulus, My Father. Andrew Marcus, Cobber, Cobber Professor Andrew Marcus, holds the Pratt Foundation Chair of Jewish Civilization. He's a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and is a past head of Monash University School of Historical Studies. He's uh, the author of four books, an editor or co-editor of more than 10 others, my favourite was Race, John Howard and the Remaking of Australia back in 2001. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I will now ask each of my distinguished guests to make an opening statement and I would like them to limit it to 10 to 12 minutes. This is Cobber Ray Gator. Right, right. Well, a couple of years ago, I heard uh, Henry Reynolds uh, lampoon, as it uh, seemed to me, the idea that there could be something uh, morally and spiritually deeper in national sentiment than citizenship. I surprised because to reveal the depth of the wrongs done to the Aborigines when they were dispossessed of their lands, for example, one has to appeal uh, not to values of a kind that show themselves in responsible citizenship, but in fact a love of country, 
and by rejecting the claim that the notion of terra nullia supplied when Australia was settled, the High Court's Mabo judgment in effect acknowledged that Aborigines could love the land so deeply that their forcible displacement from it would lacerate their souls. Reynolds knew that, of course, which is why I was surprised. At the time, he was worried, I suspect, by the increasingly aggressive nationalism, paranoid nationalism, Gassan calls it, of the Howard government. He was worried, he said, on that day, that some Australians whose roots in the country go back generations might be treated as second-class citizens, sorry, would treat as second-class citizens recently naturalised Australians. And I understand his anxiety. Why don't you and your fucking Jewish wife leave the country, just such an Australian asked me, a fender that I, born in Germany to a German mother and a Romanian father, married to a Jewish woman born in Israel, should say that Australians had reasons to be ashamed of their past and present treatment of the Aborigines. It's a terrible truth that national identity of the kind that people call love of country far too often degenerates into aggressive nationalism. We know its consequences around the world. In so many places, people are murdered in the name of nationhood. In so many places, good people defend the slaughter, defend the indefensible, because of their national or sometimes their religious allegiances. And true to the same allegiances, others fall silent when they should protest. Confronted with the deep hatreds inspired by nationalism and religious fanaticism, it's very tempting to be suspicious of forms of human community that encourage people to say we in ways that go deep and because they go deep often provoke passions that exclude much of humanity. We Christians, we Jews, we Muslims, we Americans, we Australians, and so on. Yet in apparent tension with this, we celebrate cultural and even national diversity. We appear to believe that human plurality, essentially the plurality of peoples, is not accidental but essential to the ideals of a common humanity of all the peoples of the earth, essential perhaps to our very concept of humanity. Consider, for example, the importance we attach to multiculturalism, national liberation movements, and perhaps most revealingly, the importance we accord to genocide as one of the most grievous of the crimes against humanity. We appear to be committed to two inconsistent imperatives. The first is that we must acknowledge fully in our national political institutions the common humanity we share with the peoples of the earth and the universal principles expressed in international law that honour that common humanity. And the second is to honour the need that human beings have to love the countries in which they're rooted and which have partly formed their sense of who they are. And I want to suggest today that these are not inconsistent. More strongly, I'm going to suggest that the first depends on the second. It's just a fact of human life that many, perhaps most people, develop deep attachments to places and institutions. This is one of the fundamental ways in which identity is formed, through putting down roots. Not all people, that's true. George Steiner remarked that whereas trees have roots, human beings have legs. But most people don't like to wander all their lives, especially not at the beginning of their lives or at the end. The human soul needs warmth, and for most people that comes from forms of belonging. And for most people, their deepest attachments are local, to a particular part of the country, perhaps a farm or a town, sometimes a city. They may realize that their sense of belonging is wider than this only when they're abroad and discover how, just how pleased they are if they're Australians, to hear an Australian accent. And that's not a superficial thing. Poets sometimes actually dry up in exile. And recall how deeply it hurt immigrants in the pre-multicultural 50s when they were discouraged from speaking their mother tongue in public, sometimes abused for doing so. Languages other than English were sometimes ridiculed as though they hadn't really achieved the dignity of language. Given the deep connections between language, thought and feeling, it's no small matter effectively to denigrate someone's native tongue, the language in which someone had discovered herself, and to discourage families, lovers, friends from speaking it to one another in public. For many people less fortunate than Australians, the realisation of how important such things are to them comes brutally when they lose their country and live under foreign occupation – 
denied the right to speak their language, to honour their national institutions, fully to remember their past and to pass on its treasures to future generations. In such terrible circumstances, people realise that responsible love of country seeks protection by force of arms for what is loved and is owed to future generations. So though I understand the fear people express when they deny that there's a political value deeper than citizenship, I don't believe it's a reason to deny that there can be such a thing as love of country and that it can be lucid and fine. Because it fastens onto something that is inevitably a mixture of good and evil, love of country is, however, always a mixture of gratitude, pain, joy, sorrow, pride, shame, guilt. They're, in fact, some of the forms of love of country. The understandable fears that talk of love of country arouse in many people are reasons for thinking hard in ways we seldom do about how to block the many roots that love finds to jingoism and to open the roots by which jingoism can find its way to love. As Simone Weil pointed out in her wonderful book, The Need for Roots, compassionate love of what is good and fragile, rather than only grand, noble and heroic, is necessary for this. So too is a lucid, humbled acknowledgement of the wrongs we have committed as a nation or become caught up in. And for that reason, I believe that rather than thinking less about military matters, we should, as a nation, think more and often harder about them. Even if one believes it to be an ideal, it's naive and dangerous to believe that the nations of the earth will disarm any time soon or that they will put their arms at the disposal of a world government. The limitations of sovereignty, indeed the changed conceptions of sovereignty, that globalism has made inevitable won't change that. Military power of any significant kind will remain in the hands of nation states or federations of them or alliances. There's no hope of avoiding aggressive nationalism unless people see that there should be no conflict between their understanding of the common good and the national interest on the one hand and the necessity that their nation should be answerable to significant parts of international law on the other, especially the laws of war and the crimes called crimes against humanity. At the moment, the citizens of most Western nations seem to believe that only wogs, Chileans, Serbs, Africans, and more recently Jews, should be prosecuted in international courts. Indeed, they seem to find it virtually unintelligible that an Australian, British, French, or German head of state should find himself or herself in the dock in the International Criminal Court. But if the concept of a community of nations is to mean anything, then like all political communities, all of its members must be answerable to law, law that both expresses and constitutes the kind of community that it is. In the case of the community of nations, the constitutive laws must express what should be of concern to the citizens of all nations because they belong to such a community by virtue of being citizens of particular nations. The crimes we call crimes against humanity should concern the citizens of all nations, again by virtue of their citizenship of a particular nation, if the ideal of a community of nations is to express a sense of the common humanity of all the peoples of the earth. The concept of a national interest has to do with what is of fundamental importance to people in their capacity as citizens and patriots. We should therefore find ways of persuading citizens that it's in their interests as patriots to acknowledge that like all forms of love and all forms of virtue, love of country and honourable behaviour in its name has its real and its counterfeit forms. Real love of country is distinguished from its counterfeit jingoism by at least two things, the desire to love truthfully and the desire to love without the shame that would be the only truthful response if the nation's leaders and soldiers committed crimes that would justifiably bring them before an international criminal court. Obviously, therefore, love of country can't be unconditional. Indeed, sometimes, if rarely, love of country will show itself in a preparedness to take up arms against one's government 
when the government is so evil that no one who is decent and who knows what it's doing could support it. And such was the case with the German resistance against the Third Reich. It's a truism that the international laws that constitute the nations of the earth as a community of nations express values that are in some sense universal. What kind of universality is presupposed here? It's natural and common to think that the universal values expressed in those laws are principles that can be abstracted from the cultures of the nations that are answerable to those principles. Those values, this thought continues, could be, and ideally should be, expressed in a language that consciously prescinds from the local, historically conditioned associations and resonances of any of the natural languages. But there's another way of thinking about universality. It's suggested by the idea that great literature potentially speaks to all the peoples of the earth, but only as translated from one natural language into another. Our understanding of what it means to commit and to suffer the crimes prohibited by international law, what it means, for example, to commit or to be a victim of genocide, is often deepened by art, when film, a painting, a play, a novel, or a poem moves us, for example. And art provides a different model for universality than does science or political or moral philosophy that seeks abstract universal principles abstracted from the concrete circumstances of people who are intellectually and spiritually nourished by the way they've been rooted in this or that culture. And that's not because, just as a matter of fact, we haven't been, un we haven't been able to develop a universal language, as humanists of my youth used to wish for when they hoped for Esperanto. It's because this kind of, that's the kind of universality that's appropriate to the content of great literature, content which often can't be separated from its form and whose form can't be separated from the contingencies, the accidents that have nourished particular cultures, particular forms of living, particular natural languages. On Anzac Day some years ago, I heard on the radio, in the words of a, Brit a British poet, a pitiful elegy to Australian soldiers who had fallen in the two world wars. I knew the page to be truthful because I recognized the qualities that, that the poet celebrated in the men and in many of the women that I'd known in my childhood in country Victoria. An anecdote by one of the De Nira boys, these were German Jewish men who fled to Britain from Nazi Germany and then were uh, interned there as enemy aliens and then shipped to Australia on a boat called the De Nira. An anecdote about them shows what the qualities that I have in mind are. This man was at the back, this De Nira boy, was at the back of the column as it marched to a camp on the fringes of the desert. And the Australian soldier who was guarding him stopped, handed him his rifle and said, Here, mate, hold this while I go to have a piss. The De Niro boy then said, I knew I was in heaven. And that story reveals, I think, how the universal value, in this case egalitarianism, can be inflected in recognisably Australian ways. And its spirit gives the distinctive character, I thought, to the decency that Australians showed in, amongst other things, their treatment of immigrants, at least when I came to Australia in the 1950s. And that spirit was formed by and forms the country's history, literature, poetry, song, and of course, a sense of its landscape. And especially wonderful is the guileless simplicity with which the soldier acknowledged his common humanity with his prisoner. How different, I thought, would it be if that soldier's spirit graced the politics of national identity, the arguments we have about it. Thank you. Raymond Gator making the opening statement in our discussion on Australian nationalism. This is a late night live special coming to you from uh, La Trobe University. Our next statement is from you, Gasson Hart. Uh, I think there will be something in common between what Ray just spoke about and what I will be saying, and perhaps some interesting diversions as well. 
Uh, I think uh, I'm trying to address uh, very specifically the question, uh, is Australian nationalism a problem uh, today? And uh, I want to begin by speaking uh, about nationalism in general. What is so nice and what is not so nice about it? We all agree that I think that nationalism is ambivalent and has very good things and very bad things about it. So I will also move to spe speak about nationalism in the specific historical circumstances, not just the specific historical circumstances of Australia, but maybe more, more generally Western nationalism as it is emerging and it's shaping itself in the present era. And uh, I will end up by making a few comments about the specificity of Australian nationalism in the specific historical period we're talking about today. Uh, first, nationalism in general. Uh, let me perhaps uh, approach nationalism not so much as a macro-ideological uh, thing, but just ask the question, what does it feel to be a nationalist? Uh, so it's a kind of like social psychological element. What does it feel? What, does, what kind of buzz does nationalism give the nationalist? And maybe we can most generally, and regard, regardless which nationalism we're looking at, we can say that nationalism involves both an impulse for possessiveness and an impulse for companionship. When I make a claim that uh, this is my nation, I want the nation as a possession. But there's always something else, maybe linked to what I call love of country. But I think it's love of everything that the nation involves. And it is a desire for companionship. And desire for companionship is not necessarily a desire for control or for possession. In a statement like, this is my nation, uh, when you think about it uh, phenomenologically, that is, how do people construct themselves when they say, make a statement like, this is my nation? It always involves a double sense of positioning oneself in the space of the nation. This is my nation, because this is my nation means I belong to the nation. This is my nation. I belong to it. But when you say I belong to the nation, when you say I belong to the nation, you're really imagining the nation as a container and you are in it. I'm in the nation. Here, the, the sense of space that the nation so you in, you're thinking about is more like a cuddly, mothering space, whether you're thinking about the community, whether you're thinking about uh, the territory, uh, the landscape, uh, whether you're, you're uh, thinking about uh, your other fellow nationals, all of them has an embracing fun function. They contain you. But when you say, this is my nation, you're not just saying, I belong to the nation. You're also saying, the nation belongs to me. And when you make a statement, and this is in the same statement, I'm separating them analytically, but they are always intermingled. I cannot say this is my nation without thinking I belong to the nation, but I also am thinking the nation belongs to me. And when I say the nation belongs to me, think about it. Here, the speciality is actually inversed. I no longer think of myself as a point being contained by the nation. On the contrary, I start thinking of myself as I am the containing gaze. I am looking. This is my nation. I want to look and 
capture the nation in its totality by my gaze. I want to make sure uh, nothing wrong happens to my nation. I want to control it, make it. But as I said, the two are related because I want the nation to belong to me so I can belong well to the nation. I want to control things in my nation so that the nation embraces me nicely. These two are always then together. But both of them are elements of possessiveness. Both of them are about the nation functioning in a specific way, and one might even say in an instrumental logic. I don't think uh, such modality of nationalism does not involve love. Uh, but, I mean, it depends how you define the purity of love. It might, you might think of it as corrupt love, but it involves some form of love. Uh, but when you are looking at nationalism as companionship, as involving a sense of companionship, if you like, uh, from a philosophical point of view, nation as possessiveness is more under the category of nation for me. It's the notion of for. It is there for me, functioning for me. Na nationalism as companionship is under the category of with. The nation is with me. Uh, the landscape is with me. Uh, uh, my other fellow nationals are with me. This is what I mean by this notion of companionship. They, we have a relationship of witness, of togetherness. Together. Now, I think when we think about uh, nationalism today, uh, perhaps I should borrow from one of my uh, favorite thinkers ever, uh, Frank Zappa, and uh, paraphrase him and say, uh, uh, nationalism is not dead, but it smells funny. <laughs> And it smells funny because maybe the element of witness in nationalism is shrinking. And the nationalism of social control, the nationalism where the nation belongs to me, I belong to the nation, is becoming the most dominant experience of nationalism. I kind of think about it that today we have a globalization of a very specific form of nationalism, which is what I call the nationalism of unachieved colonial settler societies. Notice, you have in history achieved colonial settler societies, like Australia in history, the US, Canada, they're countries that have been colonial settler countries, but gradually or at some point in history they said, well, we've settled. We've settled the country. Sure, we have killed, maimed, etc., indigenous people, and they still raise their voice every now and then, but really, as Nietzsche would say, what are my parasites to me? There is a sense of power that comes from an achieved colonialism, a sense of power that I've done the job. An achieved colonialism is a very different, breeds a very different nationalism. An achieved colonialism we saw it in uh, apartheid South Africa, we see it in Israel today. An achieved colonialism is a sense that I want to finish this job, but I can't. I'm still surrounded by the barbarians, and the barbarians are going to get me. 